We begin the day asking, will this be the week that war returns to Europe? Russia continues sending more troops to its border with Ukraine, 130,000 strong, so many that the Pentagon says an invasion could begin at any moment. And yet the Kremlin's line remains there are no plans to attack. The European Union, NATO, and the U.S. are not taking Vladimir Putin at his word. Another week of shuttle diplomacy is underway to de-escalate tensions. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met today in Kyiv. Tomorrow, Scholz travels to Moscow for talks with Vladimir Putin. Germany is warning Russia any military move against Ukraine will bring severe consequences. Hello, Hello Mr. Chancellor. Nice to meet you. A warm welcome in uncertain times. Chancellor Olaf Scholz's first visit here in Kiev took place amid fears of a Russian invasion. And so the meeting with his Ukrainian counterpart turned into a more than two-hour-long crisis talk. At the joint press conference afterwards, Zelensky reiterated his country's desire to join NATO. Despite Russia's demands for guarantees, it would not. Many leaders hint slightly that Ukraine shouldn't take the risk of talking constantly about membership of the alliance, because this risk is connected to Russia's reaction. I think no one is hiding it anymore. I think we should be sincere. It's our decision to take anyway. Both agreed, however, membership in the near future is not in the cards. Just like another thing Kiev would like to have, German weapons to defend itself. Instead, Scholz offered more money and political support. Here in Kiev, I am once again making clear, Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity are non-negotiable for Germany. Therefore, we expect clear steps from Russia to de-escalate current tensions. The German government is clear that further military aggression against Ukraine would have serious political, economic and geostrategic consequences for Russia. I will emphasize that tomorrow in Moscow. The West, Scholz added, was ready for serious dialogue with Russia over security matters. For many here in Kiev, however, talk is not enough. They want Scholz to act now. He should sanction Nord Stream 2, so Putin would not be able to blackmail Europe. We understand that for Germany it might be painful because their uh, business, their industry depends on gas supply. But uh, let's think about diversification of uh, gas and oil supply to the European Union. The controversial gas pipeline, however, was something Scholz did not mention yet again. Instead, he called on clear steps from Russia to de-escalate, a claim he'll get a chance to reiterate on Tuesday when he meets Vladimir Putin in Moscow. And my first guest tonight is Pavel Felgenhauer. He's an analyst specializing in the Russian military. He's based in Moscow. It's good to have you on the program tonight. When you look at where we are right now, um, do you think that Vladimir Putin will order an invasion of Ukraine this week? Well, really, no one knows for sure. Uh, maybe yes, maybe not. Of course, the Russian official line is that Russia is not attacking anyone. Russia is a peaceful nation and so on. So that's intentions. But as it was well known and quite often repeated in NATO headquarters during the Cold War in the 70s and the 80s, intentions don't really matter because intentions can change overnight or even uh, in an hour's time, mm -hmm. what's important are capabilities. The capabilities have been deployed. The Russian military is at a super high state of readiness, not only around Ukraine, but all of the Russian military, mm -hmm. including the strategic nuclear deterrent. And the Russian Navy in many places, not only in the Black Sea, but in the Mediterranean, in the Baltic, in the Barents Sea, in the Sea of Okhotsk. And actually, it's a very dangerous situation because if someone miscalculated, some pilot, some uh, uh, ca uh, captain of a ship or submarine, uh, we could be in a very serious mm. situation. There could begin uh, uh, clashes. Uh, 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 skirmishes yep. between 
directly Russian and American military. Well, Mr. Falcon, how, let, let's talk about the situation on the ground right now. I mean, it's mid-February, and Vladimir Putin, he knows he has to use winter and the frozen ground to his advantage if he wants to use Russian tanks. Uh, time is running out, though, isn't it? Because spring's coming. Uh, well, it's a sure thing, of course, that the time is running out, and that is basically a good thing, uh, because um, uh, that means this present crisis will, uh, will de-escalate rather soon. It's a week or maybe a bit more when it's going to kind of end this way or that. Uh, but even if it does end, if it does escalate right now, uh, there is uh, no guarantee that it will not uh, go again in uh, several months because you need a more permanent political solution mm. uh, for the problem. Well, what and do you that doesn't seem right now very forthcoming. What do you think Vladimir Putin wants? Does he want to move, uh, invade Ukraine and go for Kyiv, or does he want a land bridge linking Crimea with Russia? I mean, is that really where we should be looking for an invasion if one takes place? Well, an escalation may take place. The Russian military may move in. They have the capabilities there. Uh, most likely, politically, it would be expedient to kind of exercise some kind of blitzkrieg, a very swift and decisive military campaign to defeat the Ukrainian military. The Russian military did that already in uh, August uh, 14 and February 15. Most likely, they hope they can do it again. I'm not sure that Russia has right now the capability to occupy the entirety of the Ukraine. It's a 40-plus uh, million big nation with a lot of territory. I don't think that Russia actually... Russia has a large standing army, but maybe not enough. I'm not sure that they want to really... Anyone is thinking in those terms, uh, because there, it's well known that there are actually pro-Russian people living in Ukraine. Well, maybe uh, at least 20 percent of the population is, would be maybe welcoming Russian uh, troops moving in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, the majority would not. So that means the Russian military, uh, I believe, if they are moving, they're going to try to uh, limit that to those areas of Ukraine, which are Russian speaking and where they would ex expect at least some uh, uh, more friendly uh, populations than in other parts. Mr. Pavel Felgenhauer, joining us tonight from Moscow. We appreciate your time and your insights tonight. Thank you. Thank you. A few minutes ago, uh, I have welcomed uh, the first uh, soldiers uh, of our reinforcement forces. It's a strong signal that Germany is willing and capable to reinforce the battle group immediately if needed. And within the next few days, uh, I expect around 350 additional soldiers and around 100 additional vehicles. Well, that was the commander of German forces in Lithuania. 350 additional German troops have arrived in the country to shore up NATO's eastern flank. Now, they are the first contingent of reinforcements. As you heard, more troops and vehicles are expected to arrive in the coming days. Lithuania, following the African country Mali, is now home to the second largest foreign deployment of German forces. The soldiers form part of a NATO battle group which is designed to delay an attack by Russia in the Baltics and to buy time for additional troops to reach the front lines. Well, our correspondent Jack Parrick, he is in Vilnius, Lithuania for us tonight. Good evening to you. Jack, so let's talk about what we're seeing here. 350 additional German troops with more on the way. Um, is this enough to deter the Russians from any military action against the Baltic states, or is this more symbolism? 
Well, it's certainly a symbolism, but it is also significant. What we heard during that press conference at Kaunas Airport earlier, where the first 70 of the additional 350 troops were, were arriving, is that there will be not only artillery soldiers, not only recce, uh, reconnaissance specialists and medics, but also, interestingly, that there will be specialists in nuclear and biological warfare that will be deployed into this battle group. These 350 extra takes the troop numbers to somewhere near 1,500 here in Lithuania as part of that battle group co coordinated by NATO and run by uh, the German commander there. And essentially, what they're saying is that they're trying to beef up their they're trying to be prepared. They don't say that they have any warnings necessarily of any potential uh, invasions into Lithuania by the Russians. But with everything going on on the on the border, there is a sense here that this was uh, this was something that Germany, you know, could do in order to show support for the Baltic nations who've been really concerned about everything that's going on in Ukraine for their own safety as well. Yeah, yeah let's stay with that for a moment, um, Jack. I mean, we are talking uh, almost nonstop about the Russian threat along the border with Ukraine. But a little further north, these Baltic states, you know, they also have Russia as a neighbor. I mean, are they worried that the Russian threat could soon be much greater than it is now? They certainly are. The government has been raising alarm bells here in Lithuania. The Latvians, the Estonians, the Poles as well have very similar concerns, all ex-Soviet states. And while there wasn't quite the scenes uh, like we're seeing now in Ukraine, all of these countries still have a huge hangover and a lot of a fear of what Moscow could potentially do. Many people here remember living under uh, under the Soviet Union and they're aware of you know the, the fear uh, of that potentially maybe returning. Having said that, I've spoken to, to younger people here on the streets of Vilnius and earlier in Kaunas as well. And there's an acute uh, concern among the younger generations who perhaps didn't live under the Soviet Union themselves. Uh, they are pretty pleased that these new German troops have arrived. A lot of people we've spoken to say, good, yeah, we should get some more mm. troops in and that the readiness in this country needs to be there. They do fear the Russian aggression uh, that, that's going on, it, firstly, in Ukraine. But also remember, there's 10 days of uh, Russian military drills going on uh, over the border in Belarus as well. Yeah, I'm wondering, too, do people there feel like NATO is doing enough for its eastern flank, or do they feel like sometimes they are part of the forgotten eastern outposts? Yeah, there is a sense sometimes that that's the case, and also that, you know, really they because they're so far on on the sort of eastern edge of nato that perhaps there's some nervousness uh, you know not to poke the bear as it were um but i think what we're seeing now is that nato nato allies understand that deploying troops here is a relatively uh, you know positive step in, in the sense of getting onto the front foot if anything were to happen. But as we say, 1,500 troops here here in, in, in Lithuania is really nothing compared to the 100,000 plus Russian troops over, yeah. the, over the border of Ukraine. But, uh, you know, as I say, it's a symbol and, and mm. the, the, a lot of the people we've spoken to are pretty pleased and the government of Lithuania has, has expressed uh, uh, that they're very happy that these German troops are now arriving. Yeah, numbers and symbols matter in this crisis, that's for sure. Jack Perrick joining us tonight from Vilnius. Jack, as always, thank you.